France. For many of us Brits, we picture city sites, bustling streets and cafe culture. But if we head deeper into the country, there's another site that's wild and untamed. I really love France. It's a naturalist's dream. And the reason for that is all the different habitats that you find here. In this series, I'm going to explore them in search of the many hidden wonders that there are to be found in wild France. I'll be traveling to some of the most spectacular regions of France, from the snow-capped mountains to the rolling plains, from deep forest to rugged coastline, and discovering the extraordinary variety of landscapes that this country offers. Oh, that's so much better. I'll be exploring the unique plants and wildlife that thrive in this unspoiled wilderness. Hello. <laughs> and the secrets that are hidden deep within it. Wow, that's amazing. On my adventure through wild France. first leg of my journey, I'm in the Alps to explore the mountains. From the very bottom, where the meadows are lush and green, up to the very top, where the life is sparse and the terrain is bare and tundra-like, searching for the rare wildlife that survives in this mountainous landscape. These are the Alps. In fact, these are the High Alps the tallest mountains in France, three times higher than anything we have in Britain. And while they're hostile and imposing, they're also incredibly rich in habitat and consequently in wildlife. The Alps are the largest mountain range in Europe. They stretch across eight countries, all the way from Slovenia down into the southeast of France. I'm visiting the Van Waas National Park in the Rhone Alps region. The Alps were formed over many millions of years, resulting from the collision of the African and Eurasian tectonic plates. And their location right in the middle of Europe, coupled with the extremes of elevation, mean that the weather here is as harsh as it comes. You can have everything from sunshine to snow in a day. All the wildlife that survives here has in some way or other to adapt from the lowliest plant right up to the people who live here. The region is well known for its ski resorts, but once the snow melts, the spring and summer months reveal a new side to the mountain. This really is the best time of year to visit. All around, the meadow is filling with bursts of colour in plants like these alpine pansies and blue gentians. The alpine flowers are a feeding ground for a whole host of insects and important grazing grounds for cattle and goats. Up here, communities still live a traditional shepherd lifestyle. Audrey Chevasu is a local goat herder and one of the best goat's cheese makers in the region. How many goats have you got, Audrey? 100. 100. OK, and we're going to move these today, are we? Yes, we go up. So can you help me? Of course I can, yeah. Uh, I give you a stick. Uh, just stay at the back yep. and push the last one. OK. Not too fast. <laughs> Today I'm helping Audrey to move the goats up to their summer pastures, which isn't easy when there's a hundred of them. Allez, bien. As winter turns to spring, the snow gradually melts, uncovering fresh pastures. As the thaw works its way up the mountain, the herders move their animals up to feed on the fresh shoots. It's a whole different pace of life. It's like stepping back in time. It's lovely. Audrey doesn't come from a family of herders, but she fell in love with the lifestyle when working with a local farmer and decided to become a goat herder herself. 
Even just 200 metres further up the mountain, the fresh pasture offers luscious, soft new growth. The goat's constant short periods of grazing keep the meadow healthy. Looking around this meadow, it is astonishing how rich it is in herbs. I can understand clearly why it's great grazing for people producing cheese. These areas, of course, for centuries were really quite impoverished. It was a hard life living here in the mountains. And if you did, you were quite cut off. That meant you had to be very self-reliant. And the people living this lifestyle, these mobile herds of animals that have to take up and down the mountains, would rely upon the plants in the mountains for food and for medicine. For example, look at this cowslip. Now, we wouldn't encourage anyone to pick cowslips in the UK because they're not so common. We don't have the habitat that we once did. But here, in this part of France, they are quite often picked. People will suck the nectar out of the flower. Just a very mild sweetness there. And it has other uses. As well as being used to flavour meat and make wine, in times gone by, locals believed cowslip flowers were a cure for insomnia. So really, your life and the life of the goats is completely at one with the life ah, of the mountain. Completely. We more the season with the nature, yes. I love your office. It's Thank fantastic. you. <laughs> <laughs> The meadow really is an idyllic setting, and Audrey has laid on a picnic. She's asked me to forage for the salad. Well, we've done quite well, haven't we? I found some ladies' mantle for you. And of course, there's the dandelion, which gets its name from Dante de Leon, oui. tooth of the lion, yes. because of the jagged edge to the leaf. Mm -hmm. But I think you also yes. call it pissenlit. Pissonly. 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 And that's an old English word for it too, which is piss a bed, because ah, it can make people wet the bed. Okay. It's fascinating. Mm. But a little in a salad's all right. In the past, these mountains would have been completely cut off in wintertime, so food items like goat's cheese were preserved to be eaten when the villagers were snowbound. That's lovely. It does taste a little bit like the meadow. <laughs> there's a, yes, there is a there's sure. a there is a floral aroma. Mm. Okay. So it's uh, raw milk, uh, and this one. I think I'm going to add a little bit of salad to mine. Yes. That's wonderful. Delicious. Mm. Oi! Stop chewing me. Yeah, I'm not your food. Clear off. <laughs> it's wonderful. You really listen to the sound of the bells on these goats. And of course, the meadows and the goats and the people, they've become one over all those centuries. Wait, stop rubbing your head on my backside, little rascal. Audrey and her goats are staying here to enjoy the pastures, but it's time for me to move on. Further up the mountain, the landscape starts to change. The ground gets rougher beneath my feet and it's tough going. But these steep, broken slopes are the ideal habitat for one particular animal. Well, this is the reason I've come to the Vanoise National Park, the ibex. This is a real mountain specialist. The ibex is a type of wild goat. A hundred thousand years ago, ibex lived all over Central Europe, but they're a rare sight these days. Today, this herd of ibex have been tagged so that the National Park can keep track of them but they remain a wild animal, free to roam the mountains, just as their ancestors did. This is a bachelor herd, mostly male animals, and you can see they've got very stocky, long horns. You can tell how old the ibex is by the number of rings on its horns. The horns stop growing in the winter, when extreme cold and lack of food means they need to preserve all their strength just to stay alive. When the spring comes, they start growing again, making it easy to age them as one full ring represents one year of life, a bit like on a tree trunk. The male's horns are much bigger than the female's, and there's a good reason for that. They're also used as a crucial weapon. And they're testing each other, trying to work out their social hierarchy. It's something they'll continue to do throughout the year. It may look like playful fighting, but these young males are working out their position in the herd. At the start of the summer, their ranking is based on age, size and strength. 
As the summer goes on, they start these play fights to gain practice with the hope of moving up in the hierarchy. You can see how they delicately balance on their hind legs when fighting. They are incredibly agile, and this skill helps them travel through the rugged terrain. They're so light-footed that they can hop down sheer cliff faces with no effort at all. They don't even need a warm-up. An ibex can jump 1.8 meters from a standing start. For thousands of years, the steep cliff faces were a refuge for the ibex from animal predators. But when man started hunting in the mountains, the bare slopes made them an easy target. I've been joined by local park ranger Alex Garnier to find out more. Thirty meters. Yeah. And they're still coming towards us. If the hunter is here, yeah, uh, albacs never run away very fast. I can really understand the, the, the problem that they faced. I mean, their, their natural defense mechanism is to climb up onto the rock where yeah. no other animal can go. Yeah. But for a man with a rifle, that's no protection for the ibex. Yeah. It's easy to understand how the numbers decline. Yeah. By 1963, when the park was started, there were only 50 ibex left in the Van Oise. Why were they hunted? Uh, they were hunted uh, for meat, because before uh, in mountains, people uh, a hard life. <laughs> had a hard life. They were also hunted for their horns, which were thought to have medicinal qualities, and for the small bone in their heart that was used as a lucky talisman. But here in the Van Oise, they've done an amazing job of increasing the population and they take animals from here and relocate them to other mountain regions and reserves throughout France. It's been a tremendous success story. Now there are 1,500 of these wonderful creatures living in the Van Oise alone. Hunting ibex is now forbidden. These ibex give me a glimpse of what life was like here thousands of years ago. I believe that a few years ago, that in Britain they found a Stone Age engraving of an ibex on a rock in uh, the Peak District. Ah. So you know, never know, never know. One day perhaps we'll reintroduce some to uh, the United Kingdom as well. Maybe. <laughs> I could watch these incredible creatures for hours, but there's still a long way to go to the top of the mountain. I'm in the French Alps in the Van Oise National Park. I'm traveling up the mountain to explore some of the unique wildlife that has adapted to the harsh conditions of mountain life. I really enjoy these walks into the mountains because you go through so many different zones of vegetation. Down in the bottom of the valleys, we've got fantastic forests of great big conifer trees. And then as you come up, they start to peter out and you, you come to larch trees, which can cope with very cold conditions. Until you reach this, 2,000 meters above sea level, this is the tree line. From this point on, it becomes incredibly harsh for trees to take foot in the mountains. The only trees you really are finding here now are these juniper bushes that are clinging tight to the rocks. From this point forward, we're moving into tundra. It's a very pleasant 24 degrees here today, but in winter temperatures can drop to minus 26 degrees Celsius. There's a fascinating pond here, but when I look into this pond, there are two things that are immediately apparent. There are no fish, and there's a lot of amphibian life. 
It's absolutely teeming with alpine newts, real alpine specialists, and they have to be because this is one really harsh terrain. You won't be surprised to learn that they are protected by law, so I'm not going to handle them, but I am going to take a closer look using this handy camera. Let's have a look at what they're up to. The newts are quite difficult to uh, see in their full beauty. The males have this wonderful fire-coloured belly and just occasionally I'm catching a glimpse of that. I think these are pretty hardy creatures to be able to survive here at all. It looks lovely today, doesn't it? Can you imagine it in winter? Frozen solid, deeply covered with snow. There are less signs of human life the higher I climb. So this village is my last chance to find some help. This afternoon I'm going to be travelling really light because I, I want to head up to the very highest environment on the mountain. But on a journey like this, I'd be glad not to be carrying my pack. So I have enlisted the help of a couple of donkeys. And this is, of course, the historic way to travel in the mountains. The ground here is littered with rocks fallen from the steep mountain above. You wouldn't expect to see much life up here in this barren landscape. But for some small furry creatures, this is their playground. here in this, this very high meadow, there are marmots. They're really charismatic to watch because they're quite active. They haven't been long out of hibernation. Marmots are very sociable and live in family groups in burrows. They hibernate through the cold winters. They emerge in the spring to feast on the flowering tundra plants like these pansies. Marmots will mark out their territory by rubbing their cheeks on the rocks to leave their scent. They're fascinating creatures and like everything else on the mountain, they have to be specially adapted for alpine conditions. And one of the things you can see is like this marmot over here that's sunning itself on the rock. It's doing that to save energy rather than having to burn food supplies for that process. Members of the group act as lookouts for potential predators. They keep their eyes to the sky as that's where danger lies. At this high altitude, I can feel the air thinning around me. It's been a really tough climb, but we've made it to the top of the mountain. This is home to one of the shyest and rarest creatures I have ever had the privilege of seeing. There it is. There it is. I've got it. That's one of the most protected birds in Europe. That is a bearded vulture. It's just gone over the back of the, the mountain. It's tremendously exciting to see. The bearded vulture gets its name from the small black bristles that grow under its chin. What I'm looking at is the bird that brought about the legend of the griffin. And if you look at it, it has this rufous color, this orangey red color to its breast. And people used to believe that came from the bird bathing in the blood of its victims, really macabre. In fact, they feared it. They thought that if it caught them in the mountains here, it could cut their throat and bathe itself in their blood to get this red color. But of course, nothing could be further from the truth. 
In fact, today we know that the bird actually bathes in a water rich in iron, which dries in its feathers, leaving a bright, rusty orange stain. And it's also not really a predator either. It's a very specialist feeder. It feeds on bone. After predators have feasted and left carcasses on the mountainside, the bearded vulture swoops down to eat the bones, which give it all the nutrients it needs to survive. This bird is one of only two pairs in the region, and it's returning to its nest. Just one breeding every three years, and only one in three birds that are reared successfully making it to adult life. It stretches the limits of conservation efforts. So I'm thrilled to have seen it. Wow, that's the best view yet. Well, you know, it's been brilliant coming to the Alps. There's so many different zones of vegetation, so many things to see here. And I'm going to take away some incredible memories. But absolutely, the best thing has been this, seeing the bearded vulture sitting there literally on top of the Alps. So coming right to the tops of the mountains has really paid off. That's amazing. I'm so glad I casted a spotting scope up here. Mind you, I did have the help of a donkey. <laughs> My time in the Alps is over. Next, I'll be traveling west to the rivers and gorges of the Ardèche. Still to come tonight, there's a shock in store for Leanne, but can she keep her cool around Nick? We're back to Coronation Street next. Then there's a rude awakening as we head back to the 80s. Anita's got a tough decision to make. All new Brief Encounters continues at nine. <laughs>